Welcome to CVSA's November virtual presentation, Meeting the Challenge of Emergency Care in CVS. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to introduce myself. My name is Debbie Conklin. My involvement with CVSA started with organizing the Run for the Bucket in Wisconsin shortly after my son's CVS diagnosis in 2005. In 2007, I joined the CVSA Board of Directors, and in 2016, I became the Program Director. So if you've contacted me since 2016, or if you've contacted the office since 2016, you've talked to me. Uh, just a few housekeeping things for the duration of the presentation. We'll, you will be muted just because of background noise is distracting to both the speaker and those attending. Um, if you're not muted, we will ask you to mute. Also, please do not use your own recording device during this presentation. We are recording it for later viewing on our YouTube channel. If you're having trouble with your audio, you may consider using your phone to call in instead of using your computer speaker. We have about 100 people on this meeting registered for this meeting tonight. Unfortunately, that means we may not have enough time for everyone's questions, but please put your questions in the chat box at any time and then we'll ask them all to uh, Dr. Eisenman at the end. And now for the main attraction, we would like to welcome Dr. Robert Eisenman as this month's presenter. Dr. Robert Eisenman is Professor of Pediatrics at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. In the past, he has held many roles at, at McMaster Children's Hospital, including Chief of Pediatric GI and Nutrition, Associate Director of the Emergency Department, and Director of the Ambulatory Pediatrics. Dr. Eisenman has played a key role on the CBSA Medical Advisory Committee as the only emergency room physician. He has been part of both the adult and pediatric treatment guidelines, as well as CVSA's main Canadian connection. Dr. Eisenman has published studies on autonomic, autonomic function and cyclic vomiting syndrome. And Dr. Eisenman is fondly described by his pa patients as a compassionate doctor who is willing to listen and help get the right answers for the patient. So now I would like to thank I'm sorry, I would like to welcome Dr. Eisenman and we look forward to hearing from him today. Good, thanks Debbie. And uh, there may be a little while, a uh, little disruption while I try to convert my screen. Let's hope that it, that we get to it here. And there's my PowerPoint. Full screen and we want to Share screen. Okay, there. And anybody see a screen yet? I can, I can see it. You can see it? Okay, thank you for that. And we're trying to get it to the full screen here. There we go. Okay, now what you should see is the full screen. Somebody give me a thumbs up if that's what you're seeing. Okay, good. Well, thank you everyone for showing up. Um, I understand that we have uh, folks from uh, all over uh, the US, and I don't know if we've got folks from elsewhere. Um, and the topic, as you see, is cyclic vomiting syndrome in the emergency department. Now, before we start, uh, I want to share a caution about this, which is that Debbie asked me to do this talk oh, four to six weeks ago. And there's been a few things that have happened in the meantime, one of which is this explosion of COVID infections in North America. <clears throat> and of course, in certain areas of the country, uh, the hospitals are uh, pretty stressed out and overrun. And, and as much of my talk has to do with how to deal with a hospital and learning how to, uh, uh, who to talk to in the hospital, it may be hard to get their attention uh, for uh, cyclic vomiting when uh, they're trying to deal with the stresses that we have all heard about. But even if uh, you can't sort of put this action plan into effect now, it, it's, it's, uh, it'd still be good next spring. So we're gonna start off with uh, a story and I'm gonna move uh, this little panel out of my field of vision. There we go. Uh, and uh, so Megan uh, has a familiar story of having had cyclic vomiting since she was 13. She's one of those people who, in whom it's accompanied by migraine headache. 
and she gets experience, she gets uh, episodes about four to five times a year. And when she gets sick, if she can't catch them in time, they last for two or three days and are exceedingly disruptive to school and work. Uh, she tries to take uh, on Dad Strawn or Zofran, same name, at home. But if she doesn't catch it in the nick of time, uh, then she's going to be sick for a while. She works with her family doctor, and uh, over time, they have a treatment program that works very well for her. Uh, and he's written a letter uh, outlining what works for Megan. And of course, at her next attack, Megan goes down to the emergency department, where, uh, of course, she is, waits about three hours in a noisy emergency department waiting room to be seen. She eventually sees a doctor who takes, a, a, takes her story, does some blood work, and gives her the ondansetron, which didn't work at home. And then they watch her for another three hours. And uh, eventually, even though she's not feeling that much better, she's sent home with a diagnosis of flu. And um, as she leaves, they give her the letter that her doctor sent. And it's pretty clear that no one even looked at it. And so uh, typically, Megan stays sick for another couple of days and vows she's never going back to the emergency department again. So if you are a patient, this is kind of bewildering uh, as to why this would happen. And if you're the outside doctor, it's uh, bewildering as to if you've worked with a patient to figure out the best treatment for them, why wouldn't the emergency department want to use that treatment plan? And, uh, you know, um, uh, when they asked me to run the emergency department for a few years, uh, I was given a golden opportunity to try and come up with that answer. And what I was shocked about was, in fact, um, if you bring a set of instructions to the emergency department in, in the US, in adult hospitals, it will be looked at or used about half the time. And even in our own hospital, when I was running the emergency department and we did a respective, retrospective review, I found out that the letter was only used about half the time. So uh, why would that be? And in order to understand that, you have to kind of get the other side of the gurney, as the expression goes, and uh, maybe be inside the emergency department looking out instead of inside the uh, emergency department looking in. And the first thing you have to recognize is that um, cyclic vomiting syndrome, which is an enormous burden for the members of this association, is actually uh, pretty rare, rarely seen amongst the thousands of patients that are seen in an emergency department. And the truth is that most of the patients that a doctor will see actually do have the flu. Um, if you reduce it down to uh, the patients who have headache, for which cyclic vomiting may be related, that's only about 3% of the patients in our emergency department. And of those, only 10% have cyclic vomiting. So what it means is that the, if you do the math, the average emergency physician will see no more than one patient with cyclic vomiting a month and many may not see, will only see one or two a year. So they're pretty unfamiliar with it. And as I've said, they may have heard about it, but it, it, it's very much uh, in the distance on the horizon compared to the things that they worry about. So the second thing that is very hard to wrap your head around, and it's taken me years to understand it, is that uh, in most instances, doctors don't work for a hospital. They actually are contracted as individual practitioners and they are held individually responsible for the care they provide. So what that means is that if you're running a hospital and you want something to happen, you negotiate with the nurse, nurses because the nurses are employed by the hospital and um, they will basically carry out hospital policy. Uh, but emergency physicians uh, generally don't have that relationship, number one. Number two is they, because they're individually responsible, even though uh, patients will present with a letter from an outside doctor, uh, if something goes wrong, 
the emergency physician, his defense that somebody gave him a letter uh, that he does from a doctor he doesn't know, and he, he followed out the instructions, uh, won't stand up for more than a couple of minutes. Uh, and accordingly, the docs are very reluctant to be put in a situation of using somebody else's uh, instructions. Uh, the third point that I reiterated before, which all things considered, it's pretty rare. And while it's miserable for the patient, as you all know, it, generally it's not life-threatening. So in terms of getting the attention of the physician and asking them what they're worried about, they're worried about the patients who come in with heart attacks or overwhelming infection or bad trauma, because if they don't get it right, uh, it's going to be a disaster. And again, the review by Dr. Uh, Venkathesan of uh, all the hospital admissions in the United States showed that very few of the patients, very, very few patients actually get um, deathly ill. And then lastly, and I, all of you who've dealt with the emergency department uh, deal with this issue of uh, the feeling that you're being accused of drug seeking. And you know why would they do that? And the answer is, in fact, with the opioid epidemic, uh, patients regularly show up in the emergency department <clears throat> with a variety of complaints uh, looking for uh, some kind of uh, opioid. And, and the emergency physicians are gonna see several of these patients a day compared to the patient that they might see with cyclic vomiting syndrome every few months. So their mindset is uh, preoccupied with um, not being taken advantage of because they will be held accountable if a doctor in an emergency department gives a patient a prescription for narcotics and it's later found that the patient is going to multiple hospitals to get the narcotics, the doctor actually will get called up on the carpet and held to account. And then there's this thing, you can't tell me what to do. Now, as a pediatrician, um, uh, we all we know about toddlers, and uh, the to toddler's favorite expression is, you're not the boss of me. And uh, truly, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who never grow out of that. Um, and particularly doctors, emergency doctors, are, don't like to be told what to do. And when you crawl inside of that, why are they so difficult to work with? The answer is, they, if you sit in the emergency department, <clears throat> um, you're bombarded with people who show up in the emergency department with a letter or note from their doctors suggesting that they have an x-ray or a CAT scan or an MRI or whatever Dr. Google is recommending this week. And the doctors are not allowed in the first instance to just do whatever anybody tells them. And often the requests, or not often, but uh, enough of the time, the requests are inappropriate or not indicated. And so emergency physicians uh, really do uh, have a reflex of, uh, you can't tell me what to do. Not all emergency physicians, there are some that are very, very obliging but enough that it accounts for the fact that 50% of the time, uh, you know, the, the letter that you bring will not be followed. So how do you get around that business of you can't tell me what to do? And I, I've challenged some of my more difficult colleagues with this and said, tell me about this. And they said, we're only gonna do things if it comes from a trusted source. And I said, well, what do you consider a trusted source? And they say, well, best evidence from the medical literature, uh, a published treatment guideline, like the ones that CVSA put out and publish in uh, medical journals, a care plan. A care plan is a directive where uh, the patient gets a specific series of treatments uh, that has been vetted by the individual hospital, or advice from a trusted colleague. Uh, there's a famous expression in medicine called see one, do one, teach one. And doctors have learned the story of baking a chocolate cake, which is someone may give you the recipe for the chocolate cake that works, that it's absolutely delicious, 
but you can bet that when you go to bake that chocolate cake, there's one little secret or one ingredient that they haven't told you about. And unless somebody's held your hand while you're baking that cake, your cake's not gonna turn out the way everybody hoped it would. And similarly, physicians are very conservative and they won't do something that just because it's written down in a guideline, unless somebody's held their hand and um, remained with them uh, by their side as they do something different. Lastly, in the last 10 years, uh, we've uh, recognized cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which means, uh, which we see usually in young people, mostly males, uh, who show up in an emergency department with protracted vomiting. And if you take a history, uh, what you learn is that they've been smoking weed uh, on a regular basis. And the question, is well, why would they do that apart from the entertainment value? And the part of the explanation is that uh, cannabis is hyped on the internet and in social media as being a treatment for nausea. If you stop 100 people on the street and say, does cannabis help nausea? Uh, most people will say yes. Uh, and the thing about the reason for that is that there is a grain of truth in that, which is cannabis can, in some people, uh, quench uh, nausea and vomiting. The problem is there's a certain group of people where it changes their body chemistry and it actually produces protracted vomiting that looks a lot like CVS. Uh, and of course, the legalization of pot has uh, put a spotlight on cannabis. Uh, ironically, because it's interesting, more ER docs have heard about uh, cannabinoid, cannabinoid hyperemesis than they've heard about CBS. And CHS still carries the stigma of drug abuse, even though it's medically sanctioned in many states. Uh, it, uh, um, the idea of people taking a drug that once was uh, illegal uh, and of course is completely uncontrolled in terms of its power and, and, and synthesis, uh, raises questions. So that in this day and age, most teens and adults who show up with uh, cyclic vomiting are gonna be asked about their use of cannabis. So <clears throat> the, the question is, this would tend to make you a bit of a pessimist around will things ever change? And I can tell you that ER doctors are willing to change. Uh, but first you have to get their attention. And, and this is a particular challenge uh, in terms of uh, emergency department physicians because the reason they go into emergency medicine is because they've got a short attention span. And many of them have attention deficit disorder, number one. And number two is everybody in the world is trying to get their attention. So the heart attack people are trying to get their attention and the stroke people are trying to get their attention. And the people who really get their attention are the people who come in with uh, either life-threatening injuries or uh, losing bright red blood from uh, any one of a number of places. Um, so trying to get their attention for something that is not perceived as life-threatening is a challenge. So how do you get an ER doctor's attention? And it requires calling on a higher authority. So uh, there are many forms of higher authority. Um, you can get the tablets from, well, not those kinds of tablets, but uh, you, uh, the tablets in this case come from national medical associations like uh, um, Cyclic Vomiting Syndrome Association, or the American Gastroenterology Association, or the American Pediatric Academy, or uh, North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, and so on and so forth. So, is there a model for this? Well, the higher authority, in this case, uh, do create guidelines, patient care guidelines for common conditions. Uh, you can think of heart attacks, strokes, blood clots, and migraine headache. 
And the reason that I starred migraine headache is in your discussions with the emergency department, you may not win the attention battle. You may not convince them that they ought to make cyclic vomiting syndrome their highest priority. But if they actually have a guideline for migraine headache, you may convince them to adapt the migraine headache guideline to your situation. Because in many instances, the treatments are very similar. And also, it's you're not trying to educate somebody. They already know about these. So this is what we've done in our hospital, which is I sat down with the neurologist who is doing the migraine headache uh, guideline and care plan and order set. And we, we made them uh, mimic each other as much as possible. So there are guidelines which come from societies and there are order sets. An order set is the doctor's orders which state, and we'll go through some of these. You, take, you look at the patient, take some blood, you start an IV, you give some medications. And all the doctor has to do is say, sign it, and those orders uh, get enacted. And care plans are a little more of a nursing guideline of take the patient in, take their vital signs, put them in a uh, quiet, dark room, uh, and, and put the or doctor's orders into motion. So just to point out that there are at least these three different categories of ways of getting predictable care. So how do you get the emergency department to adopt a treatment guideline, care plan, or order set? And this is the big take home message. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this, which is we've talked about the fact that bringing in a letter from your doctor is not gonna be reliable. It might work uh, once or twice, but if you're trying to get it to work 95% of the time, evidence or experience would suggest that's not gonna work. <clears throat> you, you might think, well, I'll talk the doctor into it, but I've just spent 10 or 15 minutes talking, explaining why it's unlikely that you're gonna be able to convince the doctor uh, of what the, the best treatment for you is. Um, and, but what you realize is in fact, the emergency department management is responsible for this. And you're not gonna be able to find the emergency department management at 11.30 or at night or 2.30 in the morning because people who manage things uh, are there during weekdays and they work from usually 7.30 to 4.30. So you have to take this on when you're well. Uh, and that's the take home message, which I'll, I'll probably underscore a couple of times. So how would you go about planning to take on, this is a monumental challenge. It, it, how would you do that? Well, let's say if you wanted to climb Mount Everest, how would you go about it? You wouldn't show up at Mount Everest on Tuesday afternoon with a pair of running shoes. If you're planning to climb Mount Everest, you would make a plan in advance and you'd look at the, the, the route and you'd study, you'd find the easiest route. You would sit there and say, what are the biggest obstacles I'm gonna to have to overcome? You'd put together all the supplies. You would leave early because you would plan for things to go wrong. And you know, most of you know that that's, things are gonna go wrong more often than they're gonna go right. So what does pre-planning pre -planning look like? Well, first of all, you want a firm diagnosis. And that means finding a physician uh, who uh, knows something about this condition and maybe has some experience and has a bit of authority. And I have to say, I understand that most of the audience is a uh, adult audience, that in pediatrics, it's really been the gastroenterologists who take the lead uh, in this. But in adult medicine, I have to say it's the neurologists or a committed family doctor. And I'm happy to talk about uh, why it's rare to get an adult gastroenterologist uh, to be interested and knowledgeable about cyclic vomiting. Um, secondly, pick the best route. And we talked a little bit earlier about the influence of COVID, which is, you know, if the hospitals are jam-packed, 
it may hospitals may not be the best place to go if you need intravenous support. So Dr. Uh, Thangham, Bankatessen, has told me for a number of years that what she does is she organizes that her parent patients can go into an infusion center outside of the hospital uh, and get uh, IV hydration and IV drugs with um, a set of orders that are set up in advance. Or alternately, some of our patients have even have the ability to get home care. And again, uh, you know, I know a lot of people are concerned about going into an emergency department waiting room uh, and they don't want to pick up COVID. And so it may very well be worth exploring what the options are in your community. And certainly assembling the supplies. And by this, I mean being sure to have your medication, uh, the right medication at home uh, for both when you go in and when you get back from the hospital. Uh, so the business, what does pre-planning look like? Have your treatment condition written down on letterhead, you know, if possible on official stationery, if you can get a, a wax stamp from your bank or anything that makes it, anything that gives it the most authority, uh, go for it. Uh, but what you really need to do, or you're going to have more success if this is linked to an official evidence-based treatment guidelines. And in adults, we have the ANMS adult CVS guideline. Bringing the guideline to the hospital is not going to help because, as I said, emergency doctors have a short attention span and they're not going to read uh, anything that's more than a paragraph. Uh, and fourth, the pre planning and the message here is try to work with your hospital to <clears throat> get a, or a care plan or an order set. And I would say here, the other thing we've learned through CVSA is actually you're going to have better luck with a small hospital than with a big hospital. In a smaller hospitals, uh, if, you're, if you're going to be a frequent flyer, people actually get to know you and it's easier to change routine. Whereas in a big hospital, they may have 30, 40 different doctors. Trying to get any kind of consistency is going to be a real challenge. And then lastly, uh, this point about meeting separately with the emergency department chief and the clinical nurse manager. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what that's about. Uh, I talk about it later on, but just to, I mean, sometimes you, I, it's worthwhile to tell people what you're going to tell them, tell it to them, and then tell them what you told them. And so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. And what I'm going to tell you is you're not going to have much luck meeting with the nurse, the clinical nurse manager, unless she knows that the chief of the department, in other words, the physician, uh, agrees that what you're asking for is reasonable. Uh, so you should ordinarily meet with the emergency uh, chief first, but don't count on them to actually be able to change anything that happens in the hospital, because that's their great frustration, is the doctors just don't actually listen to them either. Uh, but the clinical nurse managers in a position to see that things happen on a consistent basis. So we said understanding the obstacles. We've talked about CVS being rare and trying to get people's attention. One of the things that makes the condition difficult is that while the symptoms are similar for everybody, the treatment uh, is different. One size doesn't, one size fits all does not work. Uh, and so you have to have your treatment plan tailored to your system, number one, called personalized medicine. But, and this is the tricky part, and this is, I'd spent years trying to figure this one out. You have to have a process that identifies you as having CVS. And in our experience, what we did was we issued patients with a card, and they went to the emergency department that I ran, that said, you've got CVS, <clears throat> and people would throw the card away. And the uh, receptionists um, didn't know what to do with the card because it wasn't part of hospital process. So then we developed a system called an alert system for any patient that had a rare condition, and they would bring the card, and the card said, look in your electronic medical record, please. And we could get some cooperation from the the business clerks to do that. Uh, but then the 
so this, there's this process of linkage, which you've got your identification. I'm the patient who has this, has to be linked to the care plan. And care, uh, emergency departments are chaotic places. So the care plan has to be someplace that um, it can be found for this relatively rare thing. And the best place is in the electronic medical record. So if you can work with the, your new partner, the clinical nurse manager in the emergency department to get that care plan put in the electronic medical record, that'll solve 90% of your problems. And the last one, and this is really embarrassing, which is um, a lot of emergency physicians will not even look up the patient's previous history uh, before they go see them. Because what happens is they pick up the chart and they will see 20 to 30 patients in a eight to 12 hour shift and it says vomiting. And in their head, they've already decided that the person has the flu and then they go in and they, uh, uh, you know, confirm, it's called confirmation bias, which is given that they've already decided, they've already got the treatment plan worked out in their head and you're trying to get them to change their minds. So I talked to the emergency chief about this and I got no, not much progress. And I talked to the clinical nurse manager and I didn't get much help. And in my frustration, I was complaining to the uh, admission clerk about this. And the admission clerk said, why don't you tell us? Why don't, why don't we put the care plan on the chart when we're still using paper charts? And what I realized is, you know, there are 30 or 40 docs, there are 50 nurses, but there's only four or five uh, registration clerks. And if you can get, and, and if the registration clerk puts the order set on the chart, then when the emergency doctor picks up the chart, they find this order set and it doesn't, it doesn't play into this business of someone's telling me what to do. They look at it and say, oh, all I have to do is sign this. And uh, that actually turned out to be the one thing that we accomplished that, that was more effective than anything else. So of course, <clears throat> it depends on, there's so many different variables, which emergency department. But I hope that this description at least explains some of the obstacles that you've been running into. Now, again, whether it's, we're able to do anything about this during COVID is really uh, anybody's guess. <clears throat> so this is the point that I want to make. Who are, they, who are the, the crew in an emergency department? So the emergency department is run by a clinical nurse manager. The chief of the department is a doctor and they're there to maintain quality of care, but they actually, uh, people don't always listen to them. Emergency room physicians often work as independent contractors. And last, there's the patient relations department or patient experience uh, department. <clears throat> now the patient relations department is usually there to deal with complaints, but that doesn't mean you have to wait till you'll have a complaint. If you phone up the patient relations department, well, let's say, let, I'm gonna back up. If you have struck out getting in touch with the emergency chief and the emergency manager, the manager won't meet with you. Uh, you, it's within your rights to get in touch with the patient experience or patient relations department. Now, when I ran the emergency department, the one thing that would give me nightmares was the phone call from the patient experience or patient relations department. Because uh, <clears throat> first of all, you didn't like to be exposed. And second of all, I mean, I mean, no one likes to, even if I did the right thing, you don't like that kind of spotlight. But mostly it was just a pain in the butt because it's this long process, there are forms to fill out, there are meetings to be held and anything you could do to avoid having to meet with the patient relations, patient experience was, uh, was a good idea. So to go in, if you're having trouble shaking up the hospital, to go in and say to the patient relations department, I don't have a complaint yet. Uh, what I wanna do is I wanna work with you to avoid 
uh, having to meet with you around a complaint. And what that does is if you, human relations work much, much better uh, if you, you're coming from a good place, positive place, and you don't represent a threat, because the moment you look like a threat to the system, everybody goes into their defensive posture and it makes it much, much harder to accomplish anything from once that tone is set. <clears throat> so what is that all about? So this is actually a relatively good looking emergency department compared to some that I've worked in and many that I've seen. And the question is, why do they look like that? And there's an explanation. And that's called emergency room culture. And uh, if you think about it, uh, much like schools and street corners, emergency rooms are public facilities. So one of the reasons they look the way they do is they cannot refuse service to patients. Anybody, I think it's federal law in the US that <clears throat> anybody comes into emergency department has to be, uh, get care. Uh, and in any given shift, there's a woman, usually a woman, it can be a male actually, called the charge nurse. And she's a fearsome character. Uh, and the reason that she's called the charge nurse is her number one job is to maintain control of the emergency department. And <clears throat> uh, the reason that these people, men or women, get kind of testy is the, if they are not in control, you get a mob mentality. And this goes down to little details, like if they pull somebody in who arrived after two or three other people, the next thing you'd have is two or three people charging at the charge nurse to complain that those other people got in first. And so much like uh, teachers, I, my daughter's a teacher, and the first day of, of grade one, she does something frightening to get the attention of the class, uh, just to make it clear who's in charge. And similarly, the reason they give traffic cops a whistle is uh, to get to make it clear who's, who's the boss. And similarly, the charge nurse, because it's really true that if in a group of people, if they're not, if someone isn't in charge, things are gonna go downhill. <clears throat> so your support team, has to start before you show up dealing with the charge nurse in the emergency department. And so it starts with a physician advocate. Now, when I talked to my friend, the difficult emergency doctor, and said, what would it take? He said, I will take a direction from somebody that I trust. So there are people in your community who have a good reputation, who have relationships with the people in the emergency department. Uh, but most, most of the people I dare say in CVSA are not necessarily the experts. Mostly it takes a doc who is committed to patient care and is willing to go the extra mile. And the question really is, are they willing to have a discussion with the medical chief just to say, my patient has cyclic vomiting syndrome, and we would really like to work with the hospital to get some consistent care. Because the nurse manager is not gonna do much unless the medical chief says that that's a good idea. And the medical chief's not gonna do much unless he hears it from an authority. And lastly, like I said before, if you can't get any traction, then there's always patient experience or patient relations. <clears throat> so what, there's a plan for things to go wrong. Uh, so we talked about trying to identify an alternate care facility, such as home care and infusion clinic, or sometimes a smaller hospital. For cyclic vomiting syndrome, you may actually be better off going into your little local hospital or even a hospital in a suburb, which is smaller and less complicated and capable of kind of hearing what you have to say. If things go wrong, I, I'm sure I don't have to tell you folks, avoid getting labeled as a difficult patient. And I'm gonna do a little sidebar here, which is some people manage to get the best care out of the healthcare system, and some people manage to get the worst care of the healthcare system. So if I'm on the ward, I can actually spot uh, a room 
where the nurses are going in to look after the child and the family. And I can spot the room where people are, are going out of their way to avoid. And the ones where they are, who get the best care are anticipation, sublimation, humor, and optimism. These are the four characteristics of dealing with um, um, called adaptive responses. Anticipation, the attitude of, I know we're gonna to work together, things are gonna be, things are gonna be okay. Sublimation, this may suck, but you know, one day this is gonna be better. Humor, the, the person with a vision problem says, I see your pro I can see what the problem is. And that the humor disarms people. Anticipation, sublimation, humor, and um, oh, altruism. Altruism is helping other people. And the patients who get the best treatment in hospitals are the ones who in fact are seen to be helping other folks. And guess who gets the worst treatment? Anger, it's a, it's a stage of grief. Anger, denial, bargaining, and then, uh, no, splitting and bargaining. So pay, if you, people are angry, people who are told, refuse to kind of be at all cooperative. Splitting, uh, the, you'll see this where people go and say, you know, that, that you're a good doctor, but every doctor I've seen up till now has been a, um, a crank. Uh, because the doctor knows that they're just next on the list. Hang on. And bargaining. And finally, bargaining is where people will take half the treatment. In other words, well, I will take the IV, but I won't take the Zofran. I will. And people get into this kind of uh, adolescent negotiation. And, um, you know, you can understand why, but in a way, those kinds of behaviors predict that you're not going to get the care that the person in the next bed uh, might. So I know it's difficult, but be polite and uh, try to avoid getting labeled as a difficult patient. Um, by be persistent. What I mean by this is if you have a bad experience and you are going to have a bad experience, dedicate yourself to using that as the discussion point for your next meeting. This is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And what you want to do is you want to work towards reliable, effective treatment. Uh, this point about treating the ED folks as partners, and if you can make somebody your hero, uh, they will move mountains for you. And that includes the doctors. And you pick a doctor and decide you're going to be my hero and make them feel like a hero, uh, they will often uh, do what you, for you what you can't do for yourself. And altruism, lastly, when you're working this through, if you end up with patient relations or the manager, there are many other conditions where people have a similar, in a similar dilemma of having a rare condition. And if you work with them uh, and say, look, this is not just for me, but maybe there's a bunch, why don't we work out something for all these people who come to the hospital frequently with rare conditions? Uh, so why would an emergency room manager uh, agree to work with you? Well, they are committed to good care. Most, their chief value is seeing the place run smoothly. They like solutions that make their operations more efficient. They are held to account for minimizing length of stay. So if you go into an emergency department and you're held there for 18 hours or 24 hours, the hospital is actually penalized. And if you can work with the hospital to come up with a treatment that gets you in and out in three hours, everybody wins. And that sort of saves space because uh, the, the thing that, emergency rooms dread is a patient that ties up a room where they might be able to see three patients an hour. So you actually have something that you, a bargaining chip when you go in for your conversation in that these individual treatment plans will decrease length of stay. And what you find is if you've got an arrangement worked out with a hospital or the infusion clinic or home care, that decreases uh, the number of episodes significantly in and of itself. And that's, we can talk a little bit about why that happens. So I'm not going to, I've used the 45 minutes, I've, uh, and we want to leave time for discussion. So I'm not going to go through the rest of my slides. Uh, just to say that when we've looked in the pediatric group of what works, the medications 
work between 50, half to three quarters of the time. And what that means to me is you've got to find the treatment that works for you if we're looking for 90 to 95 percent. And it's not going to be the same for every patient. And then these are the protocols for treating uh, treatment in the emergency department. And the adult protocol, uh, the only thing I'll draw your attention to is it does divide the patients up into different groups. So if it's predominantly vomiting, there's a certain set of treatments. If it's predominantly like migraine, either headache or abdominal pain, there's another approach. And for many patients, for understandable reasons, there's lots of anxiety and treating that is helpful. Uh, and this is just the protocol that the ANMS came up with. I'm going to walk through it there. We don't need all that detail. And in the takeaway message, which you've now, I told you what I was going to tell you. I told you, I'm now going to summarize it. <clears throat> Work with your doctor to develop an emergency care plan. You may find that taking an existing migraine pathway and just adapting it is the easiest way to get buy-in. Engage your emergency department manager, but have it endorsed by the chief of the emergency department. And then uh, once it's been endorsed, meet with the nurse manager. Now, this all used to be a lot more difficult than it is now uh, because all of these used to be uh, go down to the hospital, sit with somebody, meet with them in the hospital appointments. And virtually all administrators now are doing uh, this kind of thing by Zoom. So in fact, in, in ironically, it may be easier to get to them now than uh, it might have been uh, a year or two ago. And lastly, see if you can, if possible, get the care plan e uh, uploaded to electronic medical record. So that's there when you need it. And to end on a positive note, with the publication of the ANMS guidelines, it's CVS is increasingly recognized in emergency departments. Um, there's increasing interest in it, uh, ironically, because of the cannabis weed issue. There are increasingly effective medications, more than ever before. The electronic medical record may get around a lot of these organizational issues. And once something's in the electronic medical record, it's more likely to be trusted. And the existence of a plan, well, you end up getting the top of Everest a lot more easily. So I appreciate, it's been a great audience, you know, in the sense that there's been nobody rustling chairs and uh, storming the podium, but I guess it's time for discussion now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Eisenman. I am, um... We like to try to keep everybody as quiet as possible. <laughs> um, I um, So people can ask questions in the chat box. Um, I see one in there, but I also thought of one just with some people that I talk to. This goes a little bit past emergency care, but one thing I hear from a lot of people um, in the office is um, they went to the emergency room, they stopped the vomiting, but they didn't really get them out of the episode. And then a day or two later, they're back in the emergency room. Do you have any advice in, I mean, at that point, maybe those people are needing to be admitted, like how to convince an emergency doctor that's not familiar with CVS that that's the answer or just not to send them home as quickly as they are? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And in fact, when we had our last <clears throat> uh, medical um, meeting, um, and we were looking at the guideline, uh, we realized that we didn't have the aftercare built into it. Now, in my own practice in pediatrics, 85% of the patients have something that looks a lot like migraine. And if you can control the vomiting, we send them home with medications for uh, one or two days. Uh, that um, are largely their migraine, continuing their migraine medication, and then something to keep them from vomiting so they can, they can keep the migraine medication down. So there is, we didn't talk about uh, Epipotent, which is a, a new medication that's available, was as all things introduced first for uh, cancer patients. 
And uh, my adult colleagues tell me that it is particularly effective for cyclic vomiting. Uh, but as you say, you treat the initial episode, but then you, we have to develop a plan for at least a couple of days to, uh, for episodes, you, as you know, you, people feel unwell for some time after the emergency visit. Thank you. Have you noticed a difference in treatment if a patient was to say that they have an abdominal migraine versus cyclic vomiting syndrome in the, um, in the emergency room? Okay, so this is where it gets, um, you know, I wouldn't say this is a consensus view of all the doctors. Uh, I have taken the approach because trying to wrestle with this problem of getting recognition in the emergency department that it's a lot easier to link it to migraine uh, because they know how to treat migraine. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think um, I think that's a reasonable strategy. And you know, trial and error, see if that works better, but I agree. I'm gonna elaborate on that a little bit. When doctors are doing research, they really try and slice and dice and they try and break things down into narrow categories so that they can come to some conclusions. But uh, sometimes those categories in this instance aren't all that helpful for patients. And when you're a patient trying to advocate for yourself, it may be that if the doctor looks at you blankly and says, I had never heard of that before, then saying, well, pretend I have a migraine with a lot of vomiting and, and, and see what you would do. Thank you. Um, let's see, the next question is, my daughter is released and advised to see her primary doc or gastro specialist, then that in itself becomes a challenge. How can we work with those doctors to see the urgency and follow-up care? Yeah. So um, the way I'm going to answer that question is, again, like a lot of these uh, issues, if you're a patient, come down to trying to get reasonable responses from doctors or the doctor's offices. And to solve it, if you keep seeing, running into the same problem, you have to think of it as a system problem. In other words, why does this keep happening? And the answer is because the emergency room doctor is responsible for a handoff to somebody. So it's very easy for them to say, see your family doctor in a, in a week or two or whatever it is. And I watch this happen in our emergency department and I know those patients don't have a family doctor. Uh, and I, I think the doctors just tell them that to make them themselves feel better. Um, so I think part of the planning, again, would be what am I gonna do? What do I do when I get sick? And what's our plan for once I've been sick or my daughter's been sick and then I go home? And, and work through those that matrix beforehand because when you're sick and your daughter's feeling really terrible for a couple of days and you're desperately trying to get through the office, uh, you know, that's maybe the worst time to do it. And having run a medical office, I, you know, uh, well, I won't say medical office. I'll give you the example of when you get really, really terrible service at a department store or something, uh, you sometimes get into a discussion with them and say, did you ever try and order anything from your store? Because I'm going to tell you that this, this is a terrible, you know, it's impossible. And the people who answer the phone don't know how impossible it is to get through to them. And similarly, I think the doctors don't really realize that sometimes their receptionists and nurses are actually running interference for them. So again, having that discussion when everybody's feeling okay is a far better strategy. That's a really good point. Let's see, let me go back up here. Um, let's see, um, have you noticed or heard of any correlation of CDS and celiac disease? Um, I don't think so. Um, the thing about celiac disease is we have recognized with the blood tests that it's at least 10 times more common than we used to think. And it's about one out of 100 in the population. And, and if your parents or grandparents come from Ireland, 
or that neck of the woods is even higher. So celiac disease by itself is very common. And cyclic vomiting syndrome, some people think, is 1% of the population. So there are going to be people out there who have both. Great. Is the link to migraines the reason why you mentioned neurologists were typically better than GI doctors for adult CVS patients, or are there different reasons? Well, there's two elements to that. <clears throat> uh, all of my best friends are GIs, like I'm trained as a GI person. Um, so I don't want this to be held against all my friends. But in adult GI, for the most part, people come to see you. And in adult medicine, uh, often the question is, is this cancer? Is this not cancer? And so people will end up having a procedure like an endoscopy. And so many people with cyclic vomiting will have had, well, the, the data suggests they may have had 5, 10, 15 endoscopies. People keep doing the endoscopy, hoping that the next endoscopy is going to give them the diagnosis. The poor neurologists don't have the ability to do endoscopies. And what that means is they actually have to sit and listen to people. And they're used to dealing with people with things like migraine or problems that are not easily solved. So in general, uh, and there are exceptions, and these are broad strokes, but in general, the, I say the neurologists have accepted their fate that they actually have to sit in a chair with their butt in a chair and actually listen to somebody's story. Uh, and uh, again, the GIs tend to be a little hyperactive uh, and impatient. Um, so this is not so true in pediatrics, but uh, so that's. But in adult medicine, I found that we we refer our our patients who are turning eighteen to the neurologists. Number one. Number two is uh, we really do think that cyclic vomiting is something that is in your brain, not in your stomach. And therefore, most of the medications are medications that are directed uh, at your brain. And the neurologists are, are really very comfortable with these, this whole range of medications. Good answer. Thank you. Doctors here, I'm assuming she means the United States, doctors here zero in on CHS. Even when I've told them I didn't start smoking until after my diagnosis and have stopped smoking multiple times at their request, which make my episodes more frequent. How do I get them to stop hyperfixating on CHS and understand it's CBS? Well, I, I think it's a real challenge. And I think the reason it's a challenge is <clears throat> the CHS or uh, cannabis explanation is, is a convenient place to put the diagnosis, as opposed to dealing with something like CBS, which is um, kind of challenging and frustrating. And um, I don't know, I think, you know, maybe CBSA should come out with a, a position statement uh, on a little card that people can carry with them that with all the seals and all the, in, the endorsement uh, that says that, because when you're dealing with the individual doc who doesn't know too much about CVS, they're going to talk about what they know. And there's a lot to be candid. There's an awful lot of patients out there with who are, for whom weed is not only the answer, but it's part of the problem. Definitely. Sorry, I was just reading in the chat box. It doesn't seem like that was a question, just a statement. Yeah, we. Um, one thing I was going to add from when you were talking about not bringing the whole adult treatment guidelines into the ER because the ER physicians won't read it. Um, one thing we have to um, we have done is we've actually pulled out that ER treatment um, example protocol and put that on a um, like a long kind of half sheet card. So if anybody that's on is looking for that, we're happy to um, just, you can just email the office and we're happy to send that to you um, because we, you know, recognize just like Dr. Eisenman said, <laughs> the ER is not gonna read the whole, I'm not even sure how long that document is, 12, 13 pages. Um, that is 
an amazing resource, but they're definitely not going to read it. Uh, just a comment on that, which is, <clears throat> if you're in a hospital that is still using a metal chart or a plastic chart, uh, the idea of making friends with the receptionist and saying, would you kindly put this on the chart for me? It, it's very subtle, but it's like I say, if the doctor finds it themselves, as opposed to taking it from you, it's, it's much, much more effective. Yeah. Let's see. I have a question here. Oh, CBS hit me in my late 20s. I had eight years of vomiting episodes. Then migraines started to overlap with the vomiting and my CBS transitioned to full-blown migraines without vomiting for five years. Now I'm seeing a return to vomiting and nausea. Does CVS ever go from vomiting to migraine back to vomiting phase again? I thought it went directly from vomiting to migraine, not the other way around. Yeah, well, people, you know, people are so different. As you know, <clears throat> some people, um, things will be triggered by hormonal changes, for one thing. So as um, particularly women, as they go into puberty, they, that may start migraine. If they go uh, out of puberty, sometimes, uh, or the, they go to menopause, sometimes things may change. So I don't, I don't think you can, I don't, I don't think there's ever one answer to, to that question. I'm trying to think of what I was going to say about that. Oh, I was going to say, yeah. Lastly, about migraine, uh, there's a couple of, uh, I think, things that are we're looking at. One is there's an increasing range of migraine treatments uh, available. Now, CVS doctors have felt that they didn't really work. And at our adult uh, guideline meeting, the neurologist from Stanford, well, we had the discussion, and I, this is just unbelievable. We had people from all over the continent who are CVS experts. And the neurologist from Stanford said, well, do you use sumatriptan, um, which is the standard migraine treatment? And all the doctors said, oh, no, it doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. And uh, the neurologist said, well, how are you using it? And I'm going to demonstrate with this jump drive here. Oh, no, I've got a little vial here. Not quite, but. And the doctor said, well, we stick the thing up my nose and tip the head back and then snort it that way. And he said, well, that's the reason it doesn't work, because the receptors for the medication are actually in the front of your nose. And if you tip your nose forward and sniff it, the medication actually gets to where it's got to go. And A, B, it tastes terrible, and you avoid the terrible taste in the back of your throat. And this was news to the other 12 experts in the room. And when we went back and looked at the anti-migraine therapy, it actually worked about 75% of the time if you used it correctly. So that's just a little tidbit. That's actually really interesting. That's a really good, good thing to know, and probably definitely something when some of these experts are GIs and they don't prescribe that very often, probably just don't know. And again, it's um, in the product monograph, but no yeah. one ever, even the doctors never read the product. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. My son, who is 22 years old, was diagnosed with CBS at 12 years old and has been taking cyproheptadine since. His episodes are short-lived and manageable. Will his body become immune to this drug? And if so, what other medications do you recommend? Yeah, so, um, so ciproheptadine is uh, basically an antihistamine and it has this side effect, which works for some reason in CVS. Um, one of the things we worry about is that it tends to boost appetite and so there's a, a worry that the kids are going to get overweight if they're using it much into uh, their teenage years. Uh, you do seem to get accustomed to it. In other words, um, there's an accommodation. And um, so when we use it, or people who suggest you suggest using it in cycles in order to get your let your body recover its sensitivity to the drug. So I guess the question is whether it's still working. Maybe he's outgrown things, things have gotten better, and you're giving the uh, superheptidine the credit. 
Um, so it may be worth trying them off. Now I, I'll share something. You know, when I deal with uh, a lot of inflammatory bowel disease and we ask patients to go on pretty intrusive medication that's pretty expensive, and we have a hell of a time talking them into it. But then when they're on it, and they've been on it for a few years, and we take those very same patients that I spent months trying to talk into taking the medication, I find I have to take months to try and talk them to, into stopping the medication because people don't like to jump out of a lifeboat into the water. Uh, and uh, you, you know, your strategy should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Thank you, that's good information. I have had CVS since the age of two. I am now 35. Is there a chance it will go away or turn into migraines? Uh, so 90% of patients, uh, the ones we see, uh, if they're gonna turn into migraine, turn, turn into migraine in, um, uh, you know, as teenage years. So I, you know, there's always a chance it might turn into migraine. But that's a pretty long track record, so I, it's really hard to say. I've, um, let's see, I've had trouble creating a care plan since my doctor retired. I've asked a neuro who gave me run, many reasons why it probably won't be helpful. I've asked my GP who asked, who said to ask neuro. I have many years of ER visits on file and diagnosed from, diagnosis from Dr. V and Dr. Parkman. Not sure where to turn next. Mm hmm well, That's almost a CBSA question. <laughs> I know, I was the... just thinking that. <laughs> um, the person that wrote that maybe sends me, uh, send me an office, uh, office email, CBSA at cbsaonline.org, and we can chat a little bit more about that um, based on where you live would probably be, oh, huh? Belinda just said that. Thank you, Belinda. Um, let's see, I have one more up here. I was in the University of Iowa ER probably 60 times about the same visits at local ER and suffered at home without an ER visit twice as many times. I have been denied pain meds so many times to prove I'm not a drug seeker. Oh, sorry. The person is saying that they have not accepted the pain meds so many times to prove that they're not a drug seeker or have alcohol poisoning. Once diagnosed, I was given amitriptyline and Zofran and sometimes visits to my doctor for shots of fenugrin if during hours. How do I go about getting ER strength IV meds for home? Hmm. Right. <clears throat> well, um, Again, in terms of the ER strength, the usual med is Zofran or Ondansetron uh, as a first step. Uh, that, is, that used to be prohibitively expensive, but it's now generic and is relatively cheap and available. And I think what we're starting to see is uh, when it was first developed, docs were reluctant to use repeat doses. But I think uh, with experience, I think, uh, some of the physicians are more comfortable using that on a regular basis, provided that the baseline tests have been done. So that's uh, number one strategy. And then I think you can foresee the same thing for a prepotent, uh, which I personally have no experience with because our uh, we've got um, our hospital only has a few doses and they'll only release it for cancer patients. Uh, but um, the adult GIs tell me that a prepotent is a game changer. And so it may be worth pursuing whether you can get that at home. And it has the advantage of being a non-narcotic, so it doesn't have the stigma attached to some of the other meds. Thank you. Um, let's see. Are you the link to hormones in women? My daughter has tried an IUD to eliminate her period, but has not been successful. Last week, due to COVID, she had to go to a different hospital with doctors not seen by her previously who mentioned a possible link to endometriosis. Thoughts? Well, my first thought is that if you think about it, I don't think an IUD is going to prevent um, hormone-related migraine or cyclic vomiting. <clears throat> the, the way 
a uh, IUD works is that it's an irritant and uh, uh, so it impairs pregnancy um, or impedes pregnancy. Uh, so in, you're going to suppress at a hormonal level, you're going to probably need uh, either birth control pills or uh, depot progesterone. Uh, so the good news is there may be something available uh, that would be more helpful than what you've been doing. Uh, in terms of do IUDs cause endometriosis, uh, you know, that's way above my pay grade and outside of my domain of expertise. So I don't know the answer to that. Thank you. Do you, I was just thinking back to the question of the person who asked about her um, CVS kind of transitioning to migraines and then back again. Is there, so this made me think of a question of my own. Is there a known percentage of people who think they have outgrown CVS but then it seems to come back in adulthood. Mm, yeah, um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, David Fleischer might, uh, sort of the long-term registry, but I, and I'm not aware that that's ever, I've never seen anything in the literature on that note. Yeah, and I'm sure it's hard to follow because they're moving, would probably have moved from pediatric care to adult care at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't see any other questions, I don't think. Let me make sure I didn't miss any. Oh, I have a new one. Hold on one second. Is it normal for a person who in the past suffered attacks only once in a calendar year and have those attacks two to four years apart have four attacks in one calendar year? This has unfortunately happened to me this year. I've been admitted to the hospital on four separate occasions, averaging nine days. I was finally diagnosed with CVS just this October. Oops, I just missed my thing, sorry. Sad and happy actually, because I've been suffering from CVS for over 20 years and have even had my gallbladder taken out in 2012, only to have another attack two years later. Wow. So again, uh, you know, um, it's kind of mysterious as to why people get CVS. For the migrainers or the people who've got a migraine pattern, uh, you know, there's a number of elements that can contribute to it. Uh, one is um, hormonal relation to periods. Um, I find in my patient population that weather changes, much as they do in migraine, uh, there are certain people who get it when the barometer with a barometric shift from high pressure to low pressure or low pressure to high pressure. And for those people, uh, if it's a bad year in terms of weather, they suffer more. Uh, similarly, I tell those people to get a barometer and to take their medication in advance of any dramatic shifts in weather. Uh, stress, well, let me share, I won't talk about CVS and stress, but it's interesting that um, in our population of people with headaches and people with belly pain, that with COVID, kids that I followed for years uh, with debilitating pain have had a really great year since March where they are able to stay home. There's no school pressure. They, don't, they get to sleep in until 10 or 11. And it, you know, it, it's kind of slap in the face um, evidence that uh, stress and anxiety really do contribute to uh, this in some people. And uh, you may look back on your year and ask yourself if you've had a stressful year. I know I have. So <laughs> I, I think can think of it. I, I think that's think of, definitely a good point. And just what you said about kids not being in school, that is, I've absolutely noticed that in my own household with my son not having as many migraines but not having to go to school. Um, two questions kind of similar. Um, asking about if CVS can be genetic and if they can pass it on to their child. Yeah, so um, 
the CBSA and the medical advisors have thought about this for the last 20, 25 years. And certainly for migraine, migraine is passed uh, genetically on the mitochondrial, on the mitochondria, which are little batteries in your cells, uh, from uh, on the um, female gene, if you like. Uh, so if you take a history, we'll often find that there's a parent or a mom or a grandmother or an aunt uh, and they, they, with a pretty significant migraine history. And uh, CVS seems to follow that pattern. So I sometimes suggest you might want to shake your family tree and see what falls out of it. Thank you. Um, let's see. When I'm in an episode, I get really thirsty and want to drink a lot of water. Is it better to drink and purge or resist and keep retching often, causing more pain? Yeah. So that's a pattern that is pretty well described. And, um, uh, you know, the doctors are just spectators to this one, if you like. And it would seem that whatever you need to do to keep yourself comfortable, if, you, if water, compulsive water drinking uh, soothes your um, gullet, swallowing tube, then that's probably a good thing to do. Although it may be a hint that they can increase the uh, antacids uh, that you're taking. Um, there's a, a dose or there's an individual response to antacids and some people are more resistant than others and some people respond better to certain brands. So possibly there's a clue there. I have another question. I'm on the CVS support group on Facebook and a very common question are why some people's bouts very intense, like throwing up three to five minutes for 24 hours? Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, why is it, why do some people have, are so intense throwing up a lot, but then other people throw up very few times with no pain? Yeah, well, I don't know the answer to that. I think what we see, um, uh, often is if we have somebody who's got uh, very intense symptoms, a lot of vomiting, and we find medication that's effective, like on Dancitron or something else, that we can damp down the intensity of the vomiting, but they just don't feel well for the same two or three days that they used to be sick. So, uh, uh, I, you know, there's something about the intensity of the illness that uh, uh, you know, it's expressing itself irrespective of damping down the symptoms. And is there, but is there any knowledge of why some, even like say without medication, like why some people's are so much more severe than others? I don't think that's very well known in the literature currently, is it? No, <clears throat> no, I think that's a, when you think, no, I just think it's a very tough uh, question to address from a mm -hmm. medical scientific point of view. Yeah, no, I agree. Okay, I think that was our last question. I want to thank everyone that attended. I also want to thank Dr. Eisenman for giving us your time tonight and speaking to us about the very important topic of ER care for CVS patients, because that seems to always be one of the biggest challenges that our uh, CVS patients have. And um, for everybody, it'll be available eventually for a recording. And um, yeah, I don't have much else to say. Thank you very much for spending your night with us. Well, the one question I wondered about was, you know, in terms of getting answers uh, for the next group of people with this, we all what you hear is about failures, but it would be really great if anybody has some success stories, if you'd also kind of let the CVS, let Debbie know, or Belinda know, or the CVSA office just drop a line and say, we tried this and gee, things got better. That would help, uh, that would help a lot. 
I agree. We do get those once in a while. And I do agree that is very helpful and informative for us to know what's helping people and what's and what's not. So yes, that's a very good point. Um, okay. Yes, thank you very much. Everybody have a good night. Thank you, everyone.